Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNET TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director here at GNET TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. It's also a great pleasure to be joined in our virtual studio uh, with Jacqueline Wilson, who is the school superintendent of the Bennington Rutten Supervisory Union, and also by Dr. Randy Lowe, who is the assistant superintendent. And uh, as many of you already know, uh, there's a bit of a leadership transition underway uh, at the end of this month. Uh, Jackie will be uh, heading into retirement, or so we understand. We'll find out a little bit more about that perhaps as we go along. And, uh, and Dr. Lowe will be taking over the uh, top spot there at the BRSU. Uh, of course, at a very challenging moment with uh, so many things uh, kind of up in the air uh, connected to the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, we'll find out more about what they're uh, both thinking about as, as we go forward here. So, uh, ladies, first of all, thank you very much for making the time to be with us today. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, and I know this is an extremely busy period for both of you between graduations and planning uh, for next uh, fall and everything. So, uh, Jackie, I guess I just uh, sort of ask you just to kind of get us started here. You've uh, you've done the full arc in the education. You've been a classroom teacher, a building principal, and finishing up as a school superintendent, uh, uh, a career stretching back almost, what, 30 years or so. Uh, I guess uh, as you think back over the past 30 or so years, what strikes you or stands out to you as to how education has changed and uh, what's different about it now uh, compared to when you started? Well, of course, there's a lot different about it now in the last couple of months, um, which is, is really interesting to see unfold. I think the, the biggest change um, that I've noticed is a real commitment to um, teaching all kids. I think that you'll hear the language equity all the time. It's, you'll hear it at the state level, you hear it at, you know, um, at the national level, not as much at the national level, but certainly at the state level. And it's certainly something that at a regional level we're really committed to. So I think that's a big change. And um, it's not to say we weren't always committed to all of our kids, but now I think there's great intent behind that. We're really, we're really looking at, you know, what does the data say about the performance of our kiddos that in the past have been historically marginalized? And um, what are we going to do to shift that? And I think that, you know, the, um, the I think Act 173 was really landmark legislation that will push that agenda even further. And um, challenging times now as we think about implementation, but I think it has the potential to really, to really um, push that commitment to educating all our kids and putting our most qualified um, instructors right, you know, in touch with the kids who really need that high quality instruction. And so I think that's the biggest change I've noticed is really paying attention to that. Because for years, our historically marginalized kids, if you've been identified with a disability, or if you're a child of poverty, um, if they're, if you are, you know, if, um, a child that, um, as a, you know, race has played into this, um, the performance has not been the same as our, our white affluent kids. That's just the bottom line. And I think we're paying a lot of attention to that now and saying that's really not okay. You know, as a, we're getting more diverse in Vermont for sure. We certainly have a long way. I hope we get a lot more diverse than we are right now. Um, but we're more di certainly more diverse than when I started my career. And um, it's, it's time for us to really attend to that and to pay attention to it. So I would say that's the biggest change I've seen, um, you know, the commitment to um, equity and, and, and high quality learning for all kids. Interesting. Uh, now, Dr. Lowe, uh, you uh, come out of a special education background. I mean, I imagine you must have seen uh, a similar kind of evolution uh, underway uh, throughout education in Vermont and, and the entire country, I would imagine. Absolutely. I, I would support and agree with what Jackie said. I think that, you know, the, the uh, another piece that I would add to, to what to what Jackie shared is that for a long time in education, a teacher 
um, disseminated information and if students learned it that was great and if they didn't we moved on and so a big part of the shift is okay now we're really looking at the learning so it isn't necessarily about delivery content, but really analyzing the learning that's happening and creating a system in which we provide the maximum opportunity for learning to be had by everyone. And so that that is a shift in how you teach. It's a it's a shift in how we um, think about the content, the delivery model, the variability in what we're doing in order to ensure that learning is happening by as many students as possible. Hmm. So uh, as you look forward uh, to July 1st and uh, <laughs> the weeks and months after that, I mean, what are some of the things that are sort of uh, paramount in your thinking about uh, uh, how schools will reopen in the fall? I know we had an announcement yesterday from the Agency of Education uh, that schools would be, uh, I guess, expected to reopen. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's still a lot of question marks out there. And I guess I just wondered if you could walk us through uh, some of the issues and uh, concerns that you have going forward over the next couple of months. Sure. So this is consuming a lot of my time right now. It's incredibly important. And it's a, it's a, a very nerve wracking topic for people right now. All of the uncertainties are highly stressful for teachers, for families, for students. Um, people want to be back together. That's really clear. Um, we collected some survey information from our, our parents, our teachers, and our students last week, and they provided us with a tremendous amount of useful information to guide our planning. The purpose of that survey was give us information so that we can use that to do um, the best job we can as we plan for the future. So. The planning is centering um, for us around um, this primary topic of how do we ensure um, a, re a safe return while we're mitigating the infection spread. So that's what we're kind of one of our kind of guidelines is that we need to follow in our, our we've had a task force that's been working. We've been exploring six different areas um, as we look ahead scheduling and logistics, operations, instruction, physical health, social, emotional health, and communication. So we've been looking at those six broad areas and saying, okay, what's the work involved in all of these, each of these areas? And then we're going to be looking at how do they now interface? Because um, as you can imagine, it's very multi multifaceted. Um, we uh, we're keeping on top of the guidance that's coming out from the CDC, from the Department of Health, from the Agency of Ed, from a whole lot of sources, trying to keep up with it and stay on top of it as it changes, and then for us to be nimble and responsive to what comes our way. Um, we want to provide a scope of opportunity for our students and families. We want to create a system that is able to be flexible and nimble uh, depending on what happens when we return. Um, we want students to be in school as much as possible, but for us to be easily and well prepared to shift to a remote experience if we have to, so that we shift from this emergency response that we just had to a well planned out thoughtful response so that uh, teachers, students, and families have the ability to, to navigate whatever the road is that we, we face. Um, Relationships are important. It's really, really clear that our um, our teachers miss students, that our students are missing teachers and their friends. Parents are recognizing the absence of relationships and the toll that's taking on their children. So we're really prioritizing um, the, those in our planning. I've been using the terms uh, relationship, safety, and trust, that those are our priorities when we come back. Um, all of us have to learn how to be together again, how to um, navigate a new landscape of school with the virus, and how do we create a safe, um, uh, trusting community um, where we have strong relationships, even with the protocols we're going to have to have in place. And so there's a lot of really creative problem solving and thinking happening. I'm incredibly impressed at the level of input that we've had from teachers, parents, administrators, um, SU leaders as we um, have tackled the topic. 
And uh, Jackie, I was wondering, you know, what stands out to you uh, from these last three months or so since uh, the world got upended here and uh, what we, the way we expected that the school year was going to end kind of <laughs> went up in smoke? I mean, you, you folks had to really uh, adjust and adapt very quickly on the fly to uh, a whole new way of, of teaching remotely uh, to a large degree. But uh, uh, I guess, uh, what has that been like? I mean, uh, there must have been incredible pressure on, on the faculty and, and all administrators to kind of uh, gear up very quickly to, uh, to the new reality you were facing at, let's say, the beginning of April. I mean, of course, it was incredibly challenging. I mean, some of the, the huge barriers were, you know, and this is not a new topic, but um, student connectivity, reliable connectivity to the internet, you know, and, and we deployed, um, within two days time, we deployed um, almost a thousand devices for students to use for online learning. And some of these kiddos hadn't use those devices before you know if you were a first grader or a second grader you had access to a device but it was very limited and it was with your teacher's support so all of those things have been incredibly challenging and you know and the the burden's really been put largely on the parents to try to figure that out so um, i know that as we move forward and we look at what might distance learning look like in the future that built that a lot more care will be given to that and a lot more discussion around common platforms and what it, how are we going to make streamline this so it's a lot more effective um, for our students I, I think that I like to think on the positive side of this a bit. Um, you know, for for years, probably almost a decade now, and when I started my prior to being a superintendent, I was the director of curriculum here. And I remember working with, you know, I worked with Dan French and with principals at that time and, and my instructional leadership team. And we were taking a look at what needs to shift in education because we've had this, you know, industrialized model for years and, and it's been really hard to move that dial and to change how we instruct kids. So we've had a model that we've worked and it's kind of been central to our work for years. It's called Teachers as Designers. And it's taking, it's, it's trying to move the dial so teachers are no longer just deliverers of knowledge, but they are designers of learning. So that's been central to all of our PD work. It's been central to how we've operated over the last, I would say, probably seven or eight years. And this just really, um, you know, there were points of frustration over that time period, like, wow, why can't we move this? We still want to do business like we've done business. And this, you know, I guess it took a global pandemic to just totally throw everything out. And our teachers have developed incredible skill sets over the last couple of months that we never want to go backwards with that. You know, we want to use it more effectively in the future, but it's really going to, I think, allow us to personalize, personalize learning for kids in the way that we've been trying to accomplish for years. So there's been a lot of good that has come out of that. It's really just, you know, thrown everything out the window that we did before. Now let's take a look at what really worked this time, what didn't. Let's not go back to business as normal. We never, ever can. And I know under Randy's leadership that that won't happen. Um, so let's really take the, the high points and let's really try to make a system that's more responsive to our kids um, than we've ever had before. So uh, do both of you see uh, a, a role, uh, perhaps even a large one, for online learning in the future, even post-pandemic, whenever that turns out to be that uh, um, you could see at least part of the experience of, of kids in school would be, you know, online in Google Classroom or one of the other uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, platforms that have emerged uh, to uh, communicate, uh, you know, educational content. Is that uh, something you foresee uh, either by necessity or just because it simply is shown to have potential that should be tapped? Randy, I'll let you, because you've been working on that, I, you know, you're closer to it. But, you know, my short answer is absolutely, there'll be some part of that, but let her get yeah. more in depth. So I think that, um, you know, the term online learning is really broad. One of, the, one of the key pieces of information I think we've learned through this 
this m emergency remote learning experience is that having an online platform and a learning management system um, such as Google Classroom uh, provides a, a vehicle for, for students to be uh, accessing assignments, completing assignments, engaging with peers, getting feedback from teachers. So what it, it offers, some, a platform such as that, offers um, an, sort of an expanded and different way for students and teachers to engage with each other um, that I think we haven't utilized to, to its full potential. There were teachers in our system who were using that as a platform uh, prior to the pandemic who set up Google Classroom as a means of students doing exactly, you know, kind of what I just talked about. And they found that the transition to remote learning was, was much more seamless for them because their students already knew what to do. So, um, so that information has been helpful for us um, to hear those experiences of the teachers who had already had them set up and, uh, you know, as we know, the the emergency closure forced everyone to to a platform like that pretty quickly, um, and it was was challenging for a lot of people. And the the learning curve, the the growth was tremendous for our teachers. Um, so now the question for me is, how do we leverage something like that to expand the way that we operate um, that might reach again more students in different ways than we have before? And then there's 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 just continuing that um, lens of how might a an online or a, a technological platform support the work that we're doing in the classroom? What might we be able to accomplish that we haven't been able to do? And so it's for me, it's about expanding who we are as a system. Um, it's about figuring out those areas that we can enhance and expand and develop that we haven't done before that help us to accomplish the goals that we have as a system. Um, it seems like a long time ago now, but uh, I guess it wasn't that long ago that we were uh, um, talking a lot about pre-K education and a uh, whole group of other issues. It seems like it was a lifetime ago almost. But uh, I guess as you think back to some of the things that were top of mind, perhaps last December or when, when you folks were working on uh, your school budgets, uh, what, are, are there any sort of leftover items uh, from that era, area that uh, you know, you're, you're thinking of uh, how we're going to work that out when we get back to school in, in September? It is hard to think back that long ago. It was a yeah, different was a lifetime life. ago. Yeah, when we were all uh, meeting over there for uh, all those pre-kindergarten meetings. But uh, it's, it is a lifetime ago, and it's hard to know. You know, what is pre-K going to look like? I mean, that's you know, that's a place we haven't even really started to thoroughly explore yet. Because uh, what will it look like? And and because pre-K learners can't really do distance learning, very effective distance learning, I don't think. With yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing trying to do social distancing with four-year-olds. Yeah. Probably not happening too effectively. Yeah, it isn't. So, I mean, that's, that's going to be a tough one. You know, what will that look like? I mean, I think our learning for our young learners is probably going to look quite different than a middle school student. You know, um, I think we'll be a different model. So, you know, we just haven't, you know, I haven't gotten my head around that right now. I don't think we've gotten into that depth around, you know, we think of the pre-K issue. Um, what does that mean going forward? And, it, you know, it is unanswered at this point, at least in my head. Mm. Um, so uh, both of you have been with the BRSU since the Taconic and Green uh, emerged out of Act 46 and uh, has gone, gone forward. Uh, seems, seems to have worked very well, uh, unlike in some other parts of the state where the school consolidations were, uh, shall we say, more controversial and uh, had experienced more resistance. But is it your sense that uh, despite the fact that the BRSU is often mentioned as one of the more as one of the larger and more complicated uh, supervisory unions that uh, basically things are on track and going well and uh, nothing really radical is gonna happen to change that. 
I mean, you know, I, I've lived through that, the transition for, for, for a number of my districts. Also, the, you know, the Meadowy School District, and that was a little more of a rocky road getting there. Um, I would say being on the other side of that, I only have positive things to say only positive things. I mean, um, from the perspective of governance, the boards are very high functioning. Both of those boards, the Taconic and Green and the Meadowy School District, both incredibly high functioning boards with the right mindset. I mean, they have really put all kids at the center of their work. And um, they're not territorial. They have made every, you know, it, every, all of their behavior really screams we are here for all kids and we're not here to defend the status quo or what used to be or we're not here to represent our town so it's been quite remarkable and you know um, really thinking about uh, you know Taconic and Green was such a huge district that formed I don't know if we may have been larger than anybody in the state I'm not sure with how many districts we brought together and I think a lot of their success in hindsight, and I, and I don't think I would have, have known this or been able to articulate this when we were working on their articles of agreement, but the fact that um, they decided in that, in that merger work, when they put the articles before the voters, that they would be elected by all members from all communities, I think that was a game changer. Um, some of the 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 conflict that i've seen and heard of from other mergers you still have that territorial mindset of protecting my school or my kids and the fact that these folks um, represent the very intentional they're elected by everybody they represent all kids it's given them the i think the luxury to have a mindset and a distance from running schools to really thinking about the future of education and uh, more of those big picture ideas. And um, I think that's been quite remarkable and, and supportive of them. And, you know, Medawi early on, that was, that was the tough merger. We, you know, we had to have a couple of votes and they finally got there. There were a lot of issues and I won't rehash those right now. Those listeners that were part of it know what some of those were. But um, that board from the very get-go, um, and there was a lot of conflict between those two, two communities, that board said, we're going to work together. And, and our goal, and their goal has been since their inception for a couple of years now, their central goal is we will become one educational community. And um, everything they do, um, all the decisions they make, um, is really tied to that commitment. And that's been huge for them. So um, I would say Act 46 has, and it's given us financial flexibility. Um, we're able now to look, you know, right now as we're thinking about how difficult um, the pandemic and what what might school look like in the fall you have the flexibility of teachers that are across you know five different schools and you have that flexibility if you have to move somebody to another school you can do that um, and we didn't have that before and i and i look at you know what would have happened if we were not centralized and did not have kelly foster who is our food service person or Greg Harrington who runs operations they have been unbelievable they've been instrumental in supporting the system and um, I don't know what we would have done without them if we were all separate entities and trying to make that work trying to make food service work trying to make the custodial and transportation staff work um, it would have been a nightmare so it's it's really been wonderful I think mm. Um, Randy, I was just wondering, um, you know, one of the things I've been hearing frequently uh, is that the, the education fund, the state's education fund is uh, taking a, a, a bit of a beating. Uh, somewhat, it's like the last number I think I heard was like 160 something million in the hole. Uh, what, is, what does that mean to the, uh, to the average person or voter going forward? Or, uh, I mean, would there, is there going to need to be any kind of... Uh, revisiting of uh, the school budgets that were voted in Marshtown meeting to account for uh, the changed economic assumptions that uh, were in play at that point? Or, or is it going to be a case where either the federal government through a CARES II uh, process might uh, help out there or somehow or another money might be able to be diverted? Is there any word around that uh, that you've been hearing so far? <laughs> we have no answers. 
Um, uh, uh, there's lots of discussion at the state level. There are a lot of models out there. There are a lot of um, there are legislative proposals. There's uncertainty about a tremendous amount as it relates to finances and funding. Um, we are staying on top of it as much as we can. And uh, we've already taken a look at the budget that we did pass for FY21 and looking at, you know, where are there any places in which we might be able to use attrition to right size? What can we potentially look at um, to reduce our spending? maintain with not necessarily having a revote. That's not something we're interested in doing um, unless somebody uh, forces us and requires it of us. It's not something we intend to do, but we are keeping on top of it and we expect that we're going to be having to make some difficult decisions over the next couple of years. Um, and we are going to try to keep that, um, you know, at, 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 we're trying to, create a budget that meets the needs of our educational system and is it a cost that the taxpayers can bear and um, and we are going to be working really hard to do just that but I don't think it's going to be easy as we move forward. Mm, I'm sure. Well that just leads me to my final question and probably the most important one of all. Uh, Jackie, what are your retirement plans? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, or what's on the agenda? Well, for the summer, I mean, I, I hope to uh, spend some time on the beach, I hope. Um, my husband had, as a retirement gift, um, was what we had planned to go to Iceland um, on July 7th. Um, we're still back and forth on that. We're not sure if that's going to fly or not. I guess they're they're letting you in now and you, you have to be tested when as soon as you land. And so I don't know, we're, we're thinking about that, but um, I just plan on it, you know, slowing down a little bit and, and enjoying life. Um, like I have not had a chance to do as when you're in this work. Um, I, I will professionally still, I, you know, it's important for me professionally to still have some, some things going. Um, I, a couple of months ago, I accepted a position as the executive director for the Vermont Association for Middle Level Ed. That's a very part-time job. Um, but it's really one dear to my heart. And so I will be working to support uh, the middle level educators and working with middle level students. Um, you know, that, that's really central to that job. They have a big conference they always run on um, Beyond Bullying. That's well attended at Champlain College every March. So a lot of good work and it really focuses on um, middle level student voice. So I'm looking forward to that. And then the VSBA um, had reached out to me. I'm going to be doing some contracted work for them, maybe around um, superintendent hires and um, policy governance. And um, I recently have been asked to mentor a couple of new superintendents. So I'll, you know, I'll have some part-time work that'll keep me um, uh, tied to education. And the nice part will be I'll get to choose what I want to do. <laughs> so I should uh, I should keep your email address handy, right? Because I'll <laughs> call you up again for more comments in the future. Well, right. That's good. That's great. Well, uh, thank you. I want to thank you both for uh, making the time available. But I know it's a busy busy day. Uh, uh, always great to to hear what you have to say on this important subject. And uh, best of luck again, um, both uh, Dr. Randy Randy Lowe and uh, Jacqueline Wilson. Incoming and outgoing superintendents, um, great to have you with us today. And uh, good luck in the future, Jackie. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Been a I'll pleasure. be seeing you or Andy around the building one of these days. So. <laughs> love seeing me. All right, thanks again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. I want to thank both Randy Lowe and Jacqueline Wilson for being with us today. Also glad you were able to join us. Hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you again the next time. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.